Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. I'm Biola Labi. And I'm Tundra Biola. The past three years saw Nigeria's economy slide in and out of recession a number of times. In that period, econo economy watchers had severely warned that in the absence of urgent and practical steps to rectify the situation, Nigeria at some point might come face to face with the more serious reality of an economic depression. President Buhari's warning about harder times ahead might not have done much to assuage public anxiety over the economic outlook of the nation. Joining us this morning to discuss this is Sunny Ayere, founder and chief executive of Don Lauren Merrifield. Sunny, thank you and welcome to the show. Thank you. As we said in the in the earlier introduction yeah. and also in the build up to this was after the election, the first thing that the president said was there are tough times ahead. Mm -hmm. And the market reacted right away. Of course. The market lost about eighty five billion in value right. as soon as that happened, as soon as it was announced. Why do you think the market reacted so swiftly after the polls were announced? Well, as you imagine, um, most of the investors actually in the market, at least stock market that is, I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're, yes, you're, talking, you're talking about, about the stock, stock market, market yes. um, tend to be international investors. There's a bit of obviously local uh, money also in there. But when you hear a president say something like that, I mean, what's your first reaction? Get out. So, yes, um, I think that was kind of like um, uh, maybe just um, mistimed mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the, and probably not as it was, it didn't come out as more probably where he wanted it to come out. Uh, but you, that's where you need to be really guided uh, in terms of, you know, the words you say as a president. It's very important. President, uh, central bank governor, etc. The words the you world utter. Is, the world is always watching. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, uh, I think that um, uh, following that, you've seen what's happened with the economy. You've seen what's happened with the, the central bank in terms of the cut uh, in the interest rate, you know, to signal mm -hmm. we are pro-growth. Mm -hmm. We're trying to grow the economy, et cetera. So at least there's some rectifying uh, steps have been taken. Let's see how far that goes. Mm. I, I'm just sort of on the back of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that also happened during these elections, and I'd love to get your impression of just how things um, how, how you sort of think the elections went, was there were quite a number of weeks of loss of productivity across the country because we do shut down our country, Correct. which means that we shut down our country from about Friday yes. to, Sunday, to Sunday and leaving out, losing one of the highest economic activity days in, in a market, which is on Saturdays. And we'd had to do that because we had a cancellation and then we had... Uh, how do, I mean, how do all these things sort of culminate in when you look at as, you know, when you look at the 2019 election and some of the things we need to do as we sort of reflect and look at... Going forward, for I think, well, the thing is, um, I, would, I would hope that INEC doesn't make that kind of blunder again. You can't tell people that the date is set and then, you know, one week prior, oh, we have to move it again. But I'll go, I, I still understand why, because um, my understanding is that uh, at that point in time, there were a lot of things that had gone wrong uh, that INEC had not um, uh, anticipated, and therefore they had to make that decision. Um, and I think it was all in the interest of at least trying to have, uh, if I use the term, uh, fair elections. I say that with some skepticism, but that's, that's everybody's view. Um, it's really to have some, some semblance of fair uh, elections. And I think that um, uh, what they've done, uh, what they did, I think it would, from the market's perspective, was already priced in. Um, if you remember the last time I was here, mm -hmm. we all expected that the economy was going to flatline mm -hmm. uh, for a period. And I, I remember using that term, flatline. Um, and that's exactly what happened. Um, there would be very little activity. And that had already been priced in. Um, you'd expect the stocks would drop, everything will drop. And, you know, you price that in as a, as a market participant. Mm -hmm. yeah. So before I ask you about the monetary rate, I mm -hmm. want to get your thoughts on the change agenda, which was what brought in President Buhari in 2015, improving the economy, and now we're at the next level. Mm -hmm. Now, with the change agenda, he used the building analogy that he's building a foundation. Mm -hmm. How successful has that been in view of the fact that he himself says we should brace 
but tough times. Why are we still at the foundation then and not at least at the mezzanine level? <laughs> That's that question <laughs> to start off with. And then the NPR, the mm -hmm. monetary policy rate yeah. that has been re um, reduced, reduced to 13.5%. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would it really encourage lending as it's supposed to and trigger consumption? Is it, is it effective at all? Okay. Um, let me first start with the, the first point, which is um, you know, the uh, change agenda and where we are. Um, I think most observers of the economy would, would, would look at this with mixed, uh, mixed emotions. Um, there are those that would tell you that you know, uh, there has been some progress uh, you know, in terms of st you've had stability to a certain extent, monetary stability. Inflation has sort of tempered and come down to about 11 percent now and just tapping around that levels. Um, exchange rate has been relatively stable. Um, the only problem there with exchange rate is that it, it's, it's kind of cumbersome to have like, uh, um, I think it's two or three exchange rates mm -hmm. and that's what they have to find a way to harmonize that. You know, so um, you've had a lot of money being thrown at certain areas of the economy, agriculture, SM, you know, MSMEs, um, and so on and so forth. So there has been some good things. Uh, that's been done. Um, the problems, obviously, of the country are not things that can be fixed overnight. Um, four years is probably a short time to expect that you, you know, change everything. Um, and a lot of people who I understand voted um, in terms of looking at continuity, would I, you know, let's, let's continue down this path and see where it leads. Um, and I, I believe that um, my view is, 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 is Democracy for a place like Nigeria, there are those who would argue it's probably not the right uh, because of the, the very short um, change of periods. And really, you need a pretty long term mm. program. And just with human nature, you know, people come in and would switch from one to the other. And then that way, you find yourself just going around in circles. Um, so let's see what the next four years brings. And let's hope that you know, that foundation can be laid. Um, Later, maybe we can get to the mezzanine level. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if we do get there, or when we do get there, let's be, let's be positive. Um, now, in terms of the monetary rate, um, the truth of the matter is uh, a 50 basis uh, cut from 14 to 13 is not necessarily going to spoil any lending. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. um, what will definitely spoil lending would be maybe a reduction in the cash reserve ratio. Having said that, um, there is, there is an element of interest rates in terms of bank lending, and I'm, I'm being particular to bank lending. I'm not talking about things like capital market uh, issuance like bonds and commercial paper, but specific to bank lending. Um, banks uh, need to, I guess I'll use the term, understand the fact that when you're pricing loans at 25, 27, you know, whatever percent it is, you significantly increase default probability. So you hear a lot of banks talk about the fact that I don't like lending because the environment is bad and, and people don't repay their loans and so on and so forth. Um, but at the same time, uh, what you also find is when you bring loans to levels that economically, or let me use the term economically viable uh, interest rate loans, or sorry, um, uh, levels of interest rate, that the, the willingness to pay increases. The other thing about uh, bank lending is also the way they compute interest. Um, it's more like a, as if you're computing interest on a compounding basis. Mm. And you can imagine, just imagine paying a loan, and it's as if the loan is not going down because interest continues to accrue. Um, the willingness to pay, and these are the sort of things that credit analyst looks at. It's, it's more, you know, capacity. You know, what's your capacity to repay a loan? Then the other thing is also what's your willingness to repay? Your willingness increases when you're seeing that the loan is going from 10 to 8 to 6 to 4. And it's okay, I'm, at least this thing is going down, you know, but you're paying a loan for a year. It was started at 10. At the end of the year, it's more like it's still at 10, but you've paid two payments. And people tell you that most of what you're paying is interest. You, that, the willingness to continue paying reduces, and that's because that very high uh, rate. If you look at um, microfinance banks, for instance, now they charge even a much higher rate 
to the, you know, tomorrow like individuals, etc. But their success rate has actually been pretty good. And the reason for that is that, again, one is this, the loans are very short, um, and therefore the amount of interest you pay, right, even though it's high to compensate the risk. When you look at that compared to the, the size, it's actually um, acceptable. And people, you find out that the performance of these loans have actually been much better. So reality is, going back to the um, to, to NPR, is that, yes, um, I understand what the, the central bank governor has tried to do, which is signal a change in uh, momentum, or let me say in, in, in direction. Um, because over the last, from July, I think it was July 2016, when the rate hit 14%, mm -hmm. so now it's just, been, it's just like, it's been flatlined. And in fact, a lot of observers have said the, the policy rate actually has no bearing to market rates anymore, right? Um, and what you are trying to do now is to actually make the policy rate more aligned with market rates. So I think um, it's a signal, um, and I hope that um, going forward, the, the, the Monetary Policy Committee, um, yes, price stability is important, no question about that. <clears throat> but to my mind, I think growth is even more important. Um, if we don't find ways to grow at about 10%, or so every year, we're only just going to get poorer and poorer and poorer. That is a, that's a fact. We have been anyway. I mean, what if you think? I was listening to a, uh, um, a not, not uh, like a, a little video clip from uh, the uh, Minister of Agriculture that talked about the fact that when Nigeria got it wrong it was from 1986 when we started that devaluation, and for the last 32 years we've been devaluing our currency. So. It, that's progressive. And the monetary policy that we have in place, arguably speaking, lends itself to that, to just continuous devaluation. So we need to find a way to get out of that cycle to help the country and help its citizens actually accumulate real true wealth. Wow. So like it's uh, good. That's quite a start. <laughs> that's a bottom line. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's a, um, so, I mean, you, you've said so many things, and um, there are a few ways I want to go with this. But the first thing I guess I want to do is pick up on the 10% growth, because we know that the last, uh, during the last administration, we were teetering between 15 months of a recession, you know, 0.9 to 0.1, um, to 1.9% was really our growth. Yeah. Um, two things that people have criticized this president about. One is not being able to walk and chew gum at the same time, which is you can fight corruption and grow the economy. The other thing is that we're, these are drastic times and they need drastic measures. You can't go from less than 2% to 10% overnight. No. We can't. We need to figure out how to get to even... 6%, mm -hmm. then, then, then we really, then 10% is in the horizon. Correct. At this point, 10% is... It's, a, it's, yeah, it's like it's a dream. A, yes, it's a dream. <laughs> so what are some of the things that this new economic team need to do? What does he need to do, first of all? Change his, does he need to change the team? Does continuity count for something? And as he's going through this transitional phase, which basically he has to start, he started working already, so there's no transition team. Yes, yes. What we need to do is just continue. What is the dra What does he need to do drastically to change the course and get us from two to five percent? Mm -hmm. That's a tall order, um, right? Um, the, 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 to my mind, I mean, just sitting here without uh, going to my, uh, my 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 drawing board and, mm. and writing all these things down, but just reading a few things off my head. I think one of the first things is to, you need to concentrate on building the domestic economy. Mm. I mean, that, that is uh, crucial. So the question is, what's your mantra? Um, and when I talk about building the domestic economy, um, it's really talking about um, uh, changing, for instance, um, if we talk about foreign investments coming in here, okay, something like maybe, I don't know, uh, I'm just guessing here, but say 70 to 80 percent of the foreign monies coming into Nigeria are foreign portfolio investors, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the balance being foreign direct, actual mm -hmm. direct investments. Um, we need to switch that number around. And whatever it takes, that, that has to be done. So rather than coming to buy government bonds as they do, which is a lot of what those mm -hmm. flows are doing, um, let them be coming in to invest in uh, 
bonds to build bridges. Mm -hmm. And that's why I talk about one of the things the government really needs to think about, really, really needs to think about, is the use of guarantees, honestly. You know, we, 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 the, the truth of the matter is, you see, let me take a, we, we all talk about infrastructure, et cetera, um, and the cost of it, and so on and so forth. If the government was willing to say, let me put my name or my credit behind this, I'm not going to put money into it, let the private sector fund it, both domestically and internationally. But you know what? I would sit behind it if something was to go wrong. And also look at it from a portfolio approach. So we're financing rail, we're financing you know, airports, roads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of them can't go wrong at the same time. Yeah? I mean, let me give an example. Take the, uh, yeah, I mean, we only have one toll road, actually, which is the bridge, the Lecky. Yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. Now, see how successful that has been. Now, imagine you were doing five of those. They were being funded by private investors, right? But private investors are investing because they feel, well, if something should go wrong, the government will pay me back. Mm -hmm. Now, once it's been done and it starts to operate, what happens, right? The cash flow begins to come in, mm -hmm. the government walks away. Mm -hmm. But it's created an infrastructure project without putting a penny by just putting its name behind it. The point is, you have teams that work together to make sure that the probability of that project not being able to pay for itself is so minuscule, mm -hmm. right? But you need the government's name to sit behind it to attract that money. That is the way you can actually switch from money is going into these, you know, government bonds, which are, I don't know what they use, well, whatever it's been used for, vis-a-vis -vis real uh, mm. projects. That's one. Two, this is what I'll use, I'll, I'll call it like a, a quid pro quo. So. He's assented to increasing the um, minimum wage, mm -hmm. right, to 30. All right? We all know that the bulk of working people happen to be in civil service, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, of course, you have the um, informal sector. This would have also been a good time, right, to look at removing that subsidy because that is another thing costing us a lot of money that could have been used for real growth mm -hmm. rather than subsidy. All right? So... I'm increasing the amount that's going to you, okay, your, your, your wages, I'm increasing it. But at the same time, I'm removing this subsidy. So that would have been a good time to negotiate that sort of quid pro quo. We but this second happens. term, yeah. 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 But with the second mm -hmm. term and not looking at a re-election, yeah. this, could be, the, this could be the willingness to do Absolutely. this. Absolutely. The but do it at the point where there is something to batter with. Sure, sure. You see what I'm saying? So you're giving something to the people. This is a time to now say, look, if I take this back and we put this into infrastructure, your lives will be better. But I'm, giving, I'm compensating you by increasing your, your wages. So um, you have that. Um, I like, you know, the, the, I mean, it's been discussed. Uh, again, like everything else, there's always mixed emotions around it, the, the hike in the VAT mm -hmm. um, as a means of financing this wage increase. Um, but that, for instance, could have been financed, for instance, from subsidy. Yeah. Which would you prefer, subsidy or I, uh, no. more taxes? That's what I'm saying. So well, I wanted what to I'm ask that, you about you know, that hike is, in the VAT yes. because there are two um, contrasting reports. Mm -hmm. Babatunde Fowler, the yes. chairman of FIRS, yes. clarified his mm -hmm. position, saying that what he said mm -hmm. was that he wants to widen the pool of companies and individuals paying VAT, VAT right. and not increase VAT right. by 35 to 50 percent. Right. However, at Bala Ahmed Tinobu's colloquium, yes. he made an appeal to the government yes. not to increase VAT. So what Which, is the policy on the table at the moment? Well, that's two different things. So <laughs> if you're saying I'm increasing it so that if I increase the, the, the bucket or the, 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 mm -hmm. the net, for instance, then I would increase VAT by 50%, as in collections by 50%. That's a totally different thing from increasing VAT from its current percentage and increasing it by another 50%. So I'm not sure which one is which. Well, but, what option would be um, preferable? I think um, if you think about it, um, reality is uh, the one that people would probably most prefer is increase the net, mm. right? Mm -hmm. The bracket, mm -hmm. you know, um, because that then keeps it flat. But having said that, um, the government does need to increase its, its sources of revenue, all right? But my view would have been like everything else, you know, one of the first things you do 
as, say, for instance, a manager of a company. And I always liken managing a country to not too much different from most of a company. You've, you've got people, you've got everything. Is that you first stem your losses. You reduce your cost. So if you have a situation where you're hemorrhaging, right, with, say, for instance, uh, the, the subsidy, mm -hmm. right, um, the first thing I would do is try and cut that hemorrhage, that hemorrhaging first before I start looking for new ways of revenue. So I've reduced my cost, so, you know, and then start looking for new revenue sources. Um, and to my mind, and it's not even reducing costs because there's no money coming in. The truth is the money's coming in, but that, that cash flow, rather than using it for things that actually have long-term growth and actually improving the lives of the citizens, is being used to, say, pacify people about, well, we produce oil, so try and you know, buy petrol at cheap prices. Let me give you another counter-argument. Lagos probably has the highest GDP state-wise, right? Um, and in terms of number of cars to a person, probably has more cars, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, and petrol, generally speaking, is much more expensive as you go into the hinterlands, mm -hmm. which has much lower GDP. So you ask yourself a question. Um, does that make sense in the sense that the people that you're subsidizing can actually afford it. Petrol is cheaper in Lagos than it is, for instance, in Aqua Ibom. But Aqua Ibom is probably, or let me say, let me, use, let me even use Calabar, right? Probably a fraction in terms of GDP than Lagos. Like Lagos. But they buy petrol higher and they're not complaining. Hmm. I mean, really? So actually, the <laughs> subsidy is not for all. I, 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 but my point basically is that. I, I think it's, it's all, it's how you put it to the people. Mm. I remember years ago, uh, um, when I, when I, my uh, two or three previous lives ago, in uh, my days at IFC, when I used to come to Nigeria, and I remember reading the headline, I think it was this day or so, it says, you know, uh, something like, uh, uh, petrol prices go up, or Shimoli jets in. I'll never forget that headline. I think yes. it's, just, <laughs> it's so funny. But anyway, and I remember the taxi driver complaining about the issue of, you know, this mm -hmm. petrol thing. And I said to him, I said, look, what would you prefer, right? Queuing for two days to buy petrol, right? To fill your little tank because you want to buy it at whatever price it was then, mm -hmm. right? Or the price goes up by X percent, right? And you never have to put your queue in a petrol ever again. I would prefer that one, no. Thank you. Mm. It's how you put it to people. Yeah. But it is, it is hemorrhaging. And those are, so that's another you know, thing that I think the government can actually look for a way um, to how do you eliminate this, this real big elephant in the room that is really hemorrhaging so much of, of, uh, of our cash flows and that can actually be used to, 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 to good works. Obviously, you know, capacity is always a good thing. Um, and I wouldn't want to comment on you know, whether he changes or doesn't change his cabinet. Um, that's totally up to him. Um, have they done a good job? Yes, they have. You know, economy has been, you know, has, has pretty much stabilized. Um, and that will be his decision as to whether, you know, he wants to carry on or he wants to do a few flip-flops. Um, what, what's most important is my, 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 uh, my suggestion to the team putting uh, the team together um, is to focus more, which I think he's already mentioned, on meritocracy. Um, I think, you know, Nigeria really, truly needs to move away from this whole, um, you know, I don't know what's that thing called again. Um, um, something ca um, character. A federal character yeah, thing. Character. It's, you know, it's, it's another thing that's killing us. We need to really, it needs to be more on merit. Um, I know you're very yeah. pro citizenship versus indi well, indigenous. Indigenous. Absolutely. Absolutely. You've, you've said indigenous. that a few times Absolutely. in here. Because those are the things that, you know, again, you say, okay, you know, there has to be somebody from X state. Right, and then the question then is, but well, what makes you think that the you know the person from that X state is the best person? So you, you've zoned things now. The thirty-six there must be thirty-six ministers, and there must be one person from each state. Say, let's say, now the best person from this state that you pick is not necessarily the best person in the country. Yes, but the round peg can go in a round hole. You don't necessarily mm -hmm. need to pick the best person from a Boeing state, for example, mm -hmm. for the portfolio of 
agriculture, for example, if that person's qualifications are more suited to health, then Absolutely. they go to health. Totally. I mean, I'm not saying the person should go from, uh, because of when you know, say, for instance, grows rice, then agriculture must come yeah. from, no, no, absolutely not. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, it's, it's, like when you, it's like when you're employing people. Again, I go back to my theory about running a company to run the country. When you're employing people, you, know, do, you don't sit down there and say, okay, uh -huh. what is the percentage of people from this area, percentage of people from that area? <laughs> yeah. no, you you, 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 do you do that? You don't do that, No, do but you? in the private sector, the fault lines that exist in the public sector are not there. No, I understand that. have a lot of But, but, but what I'm saying tensions. is that, you see, you know, it was like uh, something I was reading from, uh, I can't remember, some professor from China, I'm um, talking about the, the Chinese method, which is more like a hybrid between what they call, again, um, selection and election, you know? So the way they, you know, they, they choose the people, right? Um, it's like uh, they don't do the kind of democracy. So it's, and they, they choose the people based on competence, leadership, right? Rather than showmanship. Democracy is about showmanship. If you can talk, make a lot of noise, blah, 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 and just hit that thing with the people, boom. Now, whether you actually get to the job and actually can do it, that is, that's irrelevant. So what they're saying basically that, you know, the, the Chinese are saying, listen, we don't, we don't follow that rule. Mm. We follow a rule of choosing competent leaders, um, not necessarily by uh, voting. We, they have their council or whatever, mm -hmm. and they, within that council, who is the best man? And they always they said, what I, what I understand from him was that the person would have had a track record, proven track record. You see, so the point I'm trying to make here is that it's the same way we start, we have to start looking even at the ministerial things. So the ministerial is like having, you know, your group managing director and then having his executive mm -hmm. directors. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So if you choose an executive director, you're going to be choosing them based on what? Competence. To do so the work. I guess you're not in the school of thought of 35% female representation. No, That's no, 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 my, my, my view is very straightforward. I am totally gender neutral. I don't care whether an entire ministry or, sorry, ministerial positions are made up of ladies, so long as the competence is there. At the end of the day, what is most important in choosing anybody, right, is their ability to prove to you that, yes, I can do this job and do it absolutely well, with passion and conviction. You see, so it's not about male, female, uh, state, whatever. No, what I'm trying yeah. to say is that they're quotas, which is what mm -hmm. the Constitution recognizes. That's what I'm saying. Those, are, that principle of those are the things that are not right. So, when so are you saying that something, working within a quota, you can't still be effective it's, and choose the round pegs can I within ask, the quota? I would love are to ask this question that? now. Would you say that what we've been doing for the last 30 years has been perfect? No, because I don't believe that round pegs have been chosen for round holes. So even working within the quota, mm -hmm. you can have improvement. You can have a meritocracy even within that quota system. You can. Okay, so let me put that this way. That has not been So let me put this way, right? And now let me ask it. So you have buckets, the quotas. They're buckets. Yes? Mm -hmm. Exactly. You said you have to pick from this bucket. That's effectively what it is. But not for that portfolio. No, no, which, whatever it's not portfolio that it is. Narrow. It's quite a, it's a broad range. So you can find somebody from each state to fill. Of course you That's can. That's what I'm saying. But the point is that, so you say, let's give an example. So we need a finance minister. Yeah, do you want to hold that for a second? We need a finance minister. The person must come from open state. No, not at I'm all. Just, I'm just giving an example. No, that's not how it works, though. Uh, no, it I don't works. want us getting sidetracked. I know, I have. But so that's yeah, I feel like we're going to get We have that up after, <laughs> exactly. But I don't want us to miss out on one of the things you brought up mm -hmm. when you were talking about um, foreign um, direct investment yes. versus um, portfolio, portfolio investment. investment. One of the things that we know that investors want to see is rule of law. It doesn't matter what we say. They want to see governance. They want to see a judiciary that's working. Right. When you said earlier, you said you you said there were free elections, and you left it there. You weren't going to use the word free and fair elections. Leading up to the elections, there were security warnings from global partners around the world. But one of the things that was really dangerous were some of the things that were happening with the judiciary. You can't ask people to bring money into a country in which we, they don't believe that there is a running and working judiciary. So what is the work, and, and once again, communication, we can say it has been a challenge for this president. What are the things that we need to do to truly turn the tide, to become 
a darling again among investment community conversation? Um, like we said, the, 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 the approach, um, I think you've already answered the question, which is the fact that communication has not been you know, the biggest strength of, of, of you know, the last presidency, and let's hope that that improves going forward. Even though, like I said, um, and I want to talk about communication, I'm talking about, you know, from addition of, you know, coming to uh, as the PR uh, agent for the presidency, I'm talking about the president being able to actually address, you know, uh, the world, the world uh, on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, it's like what you see with the Ghanaian present, president mm -hmm. today, for instance, uh, or say, for instance, Paul Gakami of, uh, of Rwanda, mm -hmm. you know, or the guy, the, um, uh, his name escapes me right now, but uh, Kenya. Uh, um, Uhuru, Kenya. Uhuru, exactly, exactly. Again, you know, and even Cyril, Cyril Ramaphosa. Yes, has, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. It's, exactly, exactly. Again, it's you know just being able to have you know, been a good orator, which again helped Obama even in his own time. Those are the things that help because, you know, what truly do you invest in? You invest in people. True. That's what you invest in. Um, like someone was saying to me uh, recently, that Nigeria is not, a, it's not an oil company, it's now an exporter of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sad but true. Mm -hmm. But true. It's an exporter of people. And people go out because what they're saying is that remittances okay, is actually now bringing in more cash yeah. flow than your oil. All right? So it's like people going out, you, exp you sell them out there, and then they bring you know, remittances aside. But anyway, um, the, 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 the truth is, people are Nigeria's biggest asset. And, you know, the representative of the people is what would decide how people view uh, that economy. And the things you do, obviously, and the actions you take, for instance, and what you mentioned with respect to the judiciary just before the election, for instance, there are those that would say did not give a lot of comfort because my understanding is that um, this more or less ended up, you know, exactly. So, um, uh, almost vindicated, yes. Yes, you know, so, uh, and then it, it basically shows, uh, yeah, it doesn't put the government in a very good light. In other words, you know, you need to let the different arms of government work independently according to the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, but that, that um, you know, has not really been the, the, the case. I think it's really more, um, uh, like everything else, it's just, it's more to do with communication. How can we, yeah. I mean, what time, I mean, give, like, what schedule do we need? To, do we have six months to turn this around? I mean, what would it take for investors to say we're coming back to Nigeria? Um, a very coordinated um, revival plan. A very coordinated revival plan. Um, so it's, it's, it's like I was saying to my team uh, on Friday, I said, you know, there are you, you, you put a timeline together. So we're going to do this between this period and this period, right? And you say, these are all the different things we're going to do, the milestones that we have to reach. What then gives comfort to anybody is being very clear and articulate as to how you want to achieve each milestone. You see? Mm -hmm. I so give an, so I give an example, for instance, when we talked about the VAT, okay. right? Look at that, for instance, disparity. Are we widening the net or are we increasing the interest rate? Again. There's no clarity mm -hmm. there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it's being very clear and articulate as to how you want to make each. So it's like when someone says, I always say to people, you know, when you, when you say uh, success, it's like going from A to B, right? Now, the first thing about success is knowing that I, I want to go to B. You have to know where you're going to. That's number one. That's the first thing. So investor needs to be clear. Nigeria knows exactly where it wants to go to, right? Now, give me a very clear, articulate plan as to how you want to get there. It doesn't have to be in four years, okay? And that's why you see countries that have actually been able to make things happen for themselves have had these, what we call, long-term master plans. But it's one thing having plans, and Nigeria, a lot of people have said, we, 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 it's easy for us to articulate plans. It's about what? Execution. So. You have a plan that's made, and I've seen this happen even in my own industry. You know, someone comes up with a master plan, another person comes in and says, no, I don't want that master plan, I want my own master plan, you know, and then, and so on and so forth. But the reality is, I mean, take Lagos State, for instance, what was the issue? Oh, he's not following the plan, which arguably was a good point, because the truth is, you're saying, we have this plan, 
Very and whoever comes in that. must stick to this mm -hmm. plan. And that is important. So what is the yeah. what is missing? Because you mm -hmm. have the Ministry of Trade and Investment, you have the Vice uh, President's, President's Office. Office. Yes. They have all these plans. Yes. They're trying to boost our ranking on yes, the World ease Bank's ease of doing yeah. business, yeah. Business, yeah. business, which, as Mr. Labi just said oh. now, one of the major components is enforcing contracts. Yes. Mm -hmm. If your legal system mm -hmm. is not trusted, yes. then you're pretty much dead in the water. Correct. So what exactly is the problem? Because they have all these plans, mm -hmm. don't they? Execution. It's execution now. It's always been the problem, execution. You know, and not just execution, but stayed execution. What I mean by that is staying to the course. So you have to, you know, as much as people have their own ill wills about, uh, you know, Ashur Adru uh, Tinubu, the point is, is that that point about, you know what, we have this plan and it must be stuck to. It's extremely important. It's like, a, again, going back to simple company uh, matrix, the way we think. You, you, you have, you, you, you're trying to build a company, you have a dream, you have a place, you've got a goal. What happens? You don't, you don't move from one CEO, one CEO to the other, whatever, the plan is stuck to. So how many plans have been made? Several. Plethora. <laughs> how many, exactly. So the point is, what, you, know, you have to pick one and stick to one, and also prove to investors that you are sticking to it. And then people, it, it, over time, and I've always said, the first thing that gets any investor excited about a country is the fact that the domestic economy is investing in that economy. Mm. That's the first thing. So when you have people that the first narrow you make, you want to take it out to now put it somewhere else. Why would somebody that has money out come and put it in there? When sure. So is this money? why we have this 13-year mm -hmm. low yes. in terms of capital importation, this lack of mm -hmm. confidence? But I want to talk to you about the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Mm -hmm. Why has Nigeria not signed it? You know, um, that is one thing that baffles me a lot, I, I have to say. Um, I've never seen the agreement. I don't know what the clauses uh, are, so I don't, I don't know what the legalese that's in there and why there is that sort of um, uh, fear. No, it's economic okay. protectionism. Those are, mm -hmm. That's what the president... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that's his rationale. Okay, and I'm asking myself, okay, well, so if we open up our borders, it means that goods are coming in. My, our ability to actually create ours, we're not that strong enough. Yeah, there could be an argument there. Um, truth is, I mean, reality is, if you take a country like South Africa, which is probably either the first or second, we, we fluctuate back and forth uh, in terms of the size GDP size. Mm -hmm. South Africa, for instance, is more uh, what I would call a self-enduring um, economy. They manufacture a lot yeah. of stuff in there. So you can imagine if, for instance, you had totally open borders um, and stuff was coming in like chairs, you know, at a fraction of the price mm -hmm. which you can actually manufacture it here, then you never actually set up your own manufacturing base. But you see, that is still not an excuse per se. In other words, it's like what they did with the cars. You're not producing cars, then you hike up the price of cars. I mean, really? Yeah. So, you know, th th so yeah. that's the point. So the, the thing is that um, I, see, I see where um, the government is coming from, but I think that, you know, um, a lot of measures need to be put in place to ensure that manufacturing, all the things that would say, yes, we can also be a competitive economy, right, are being put in place. Those things are not. Starting with, for instance, right, having such a high cost of borrowing, you know? Um, you know, you say it's inflation. Um, but it's part of the reasons why you have that high cost of borrowing. But reality is, the only way you can deflate an economy that is not being um, driven, well, the inflation is not being driven by demand, right, is by actually um, bringing down the cost of uh, funding so that those, um, I would call it like the, 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 the cost of doing business, mm -hmm. not the cost of doing business, but the cost of manufacturing, the cost of, 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 yeah, of creating uh, uh, infrastructure, for instance, is reduced, mm. right? Um, I give you an example. You speak to foreign investors and they'll tell you what would like to come fund the bridge, say. Um, if we do it in dollars, you know, you can't really pay because the cash flow mm -hmm. is in Naira. Um, if we fund it in Naira, it becomes economically not viable. And we can't actually swap because your currency is not convertible, so. Mm. <laughs> that's the truth, sure. and that's what happens. So the, the truth is you've got to make, 
You know, you, so you have to make funding a bridge, for instance, in Naira, mm. yeah, um, at a, a rate that is economically viable for that bridge to work, mm. you know, for the railway to work, for all the different things that you need, whether it's hard infrastructure. And even though we keep talking about hard infrastructure, let's not forget about the other thing, which I think they're, being, they're working on that now, which is the whole ease of doing business, soft infrastructure. A lot of people forget about that, but that is critical. And that's the borders, I mean, sort of immigration borders, working. Yeah. Setting uh, up companies, um, just making, that's the whole ease of doing business, making it so easy. If you look at people like uh, countries like, working, yeah, those type like of um, Kiga, uh, Rwanda, for mm -hmm. instance, one of the first things they did was remove a lot of bottlenecks. Yes. You see, you know, the, 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 the truth is, is that one of the problems we truly have as a country is, um, is that mentality of it must, everything must come to the center. We must hold on to it. You know, it's like, um, if I can put a simple analogy, it's like, uh, you know, having a child and yeah, like a child, you, you, you're a parent, you want to hold on to that child and mother and mother and mother and father, whatever. But the thing is, if you don't let the child go, even fall and stand up, that child can never and the truth is, the pattern is that, the, you know, the more you hold on to all these things, right, the, the, the more difficult it is for Nigeria to actually realize its potential. You know, you have to, you, these things, you have to let them go. And it's like trying to say, let the, let the, let the markets work. Let, let, you know, the, it's like allowing uh, uh, capitalism, but to some measured extent, work, you know, and not trying to hold on to everything, because that is what, we've done, everything has been so centered, um, and it's not allowed the country to actually actualize its, its full potential. I want to pick up on that, mm -hmm. um, and I want to ask you about the CBN governor, mm -hmm. um, Emifele, whose term is coming yeah. to, and she then there's July. a lot of conversations about what this means, if the president might surprise us and actually extend his term, or if he doesn't extend his term, what that space might look like, and once again, what some of the policies might be. Do you foresee this government sustaining the policies of their last, the last four years, or do you actually see them sort of, almost sort of doing what you said, which is letting capitalism grow to a certain point, which is letting the Naira float and seeing where it lands? And also, that might end up taking care of some of the other issues we have around infrastructure and capital projects. True, 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 true. Um, so we start with uh, the governor's tenor. Yes, you're right. It is coming to an end. Um, you know, uh, again, going to the point of continuity, um, we've not had a governor that sat on that seat mm -hmm. for 10 years. And the truth of the matter is, you need to have someone who can sit there for 10 years. Why is that? Because I but, looked it up and it's not yeah, no, politics. No. The it's last not. person I think that did 10 years, I'm not even sure whether it was Joseph Sanusi um, that did 10 years. I think it was probably, I'm not sure. I really, I'm not sure. But I know that from, his, from Saludo that took over, sure. right, it's been 555 five, five yeah. so far. There hasn't been anybody so far that done 10. Uh, yeah. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's high time we did allow uh, a 10 year, because um, continuity is very important. And that's one of the problems. Because you know, think about it. Someone new comes in, they have a totally new agenda again. So everything goes the other way, you know. Um, and then, so, it will, so you're saying it will serve Nigeria? I think it would. I think it would. I think the, at the end of the day, the, the truth of the matter is, is that, um, you know, what, you, what you're looking for is, um, and, I, and I guess maybe that sort of uh, signal point, you know, 50 basis point drop, even though it's not just his decision, um, is probably a way to say, look, we're, we're going to, you know, shift towards this, mm -hmm. this growth level. I mean, the truth is, you know, has he done a good job? I think he has. I mean, look, you know, um, yes, it was a bit shaky at the start, um, and so it, it will be. Um, it was a tough time then, and, you know, there was a lot of, uh, let me call it, uh, interference um, in that role. You know, he didn't have the, what I'll call, full autonomy to do whatever he wanted to do. He couldn't really. Um, so, for instance, that prolonged time when the, uh, the Naira went to like 500 and something, mm -hmm. I mean, I think if he was totally at his discretion, he would have done that, you know, uh, much earlier and probably would have been a 250 today. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, it is what it is. 
But I, I think it would be good to see that continuity going through. The issue of um, you know, changing our monetary policy, you talked about floating in Nara, probably not a pure float. Um, I always admire the way that um, Saludo ran the economy, uh, the central bank, and ran the, 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 the currency at the time. And I really wish we could you know, uh, explore reverting to that. Um, you know, today, we, we have, I'm going to give it, I, I, I'll take a small detour here. You, you, you have economists, um, you know, that I read about that talk things like, you know, um, it begs more questions than answers. Um, you know, and I always, I always, I always, I always um, remember my first interview um, with uh, credit uh, agencies, Moody's and Standard & Poor's. And when the analyst there was asking you know, my bosses at the time, I'm talking about the uh, early 90s now, no, yeah, early mid 90s, you know, asking them, you know, who pays your salary? Who actually signs your checks? And I was there thinking, why did you ask me all that question personally? Right, well the reality is, it made me later on understand what incentive compatibility or incentive alignment means. So, you know, Economists that are paid in U.S. dollars, for instance, are paid in U.S. dollars because investors are buying Nigerian bonds at 15%, right? And, of course, you know, they're not paid in Naira. They're paid in U.S. dollars. And investors are making a killing buying our paper here. You, you bring dollars in, you swap it to Naira, you get 15%. You're taking it out, you swap it back to dollars with 15% in dollars, and you walk away. Of course, the idea would be that, well, we think the interest rate should be much higher and it really shouldn't go down and, you know, this begs more questions than answers. And I have another shop, again, that, you know, that does that kind of stuff and says, well, you know, it really shouldn't go lower than that because, you know, then the, the, the portfolio investors would, would want to run the bank. Sure. How can you hold a country hostage <laughs> to this small portfolio <laughs> investors? Yeah. I mean, really, yeah. how, exactly. How can you hold, exactly, and the entire economy is held hostage to, oh, you know, this, what is the quantum of, this money, this small portfolio investors that are coming in vis-a-vis -vis the entire economy of Nigeria. God, jeez. You know? So the, the, the thing is, I would like to get to a point, or I'd like the central bank to get to a point where the idea of, you know, uh, people buying Nigerian bonds or whatever is all based on whether interest rate is high or our currency is based on whether people buy our bonds or not. Mm. You know? Um, it's such an archaic way, even from an economist, financial economist, which I am a financial economist, way of managing an economy. Mm. It's so a cake. And obviously all it does is just puts your economy in a, in a very, in a yo-yo situation, mm. where it's just based on, you know. So if you look at going back to the time when you looked at whether it was more like a managed float, the Naira was more of a managed float, for instance, uh, under Saludo's time. I, nobody talked about things like, oh, if portfolio investors don't buy our bonds, or ah, our currency is going to... It's thank true. you. Yeah. So I would like to see that over this next four or five years, if that continuity was to happen, you know, that the current central bank governor can actually switch, you know, the way we manage our currency that way. I mean, today, you know, what's helped the currencies has been those interventions he's been doing. But I think, you know, we can actually move to even a, a better method of doing it in such a way that a managed float might take away a lot of that pressure. And it'll take away the multiple windows? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. Well, I'm, 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 I'm not sure. I know that at the time, uh, under Saludo, what he wanted was to converge, mm -hmm. you know, to one rate and even got to the point where he wanted to do a, um, what's the word again? Uh, the word escapes me, but something like a, re a recalibration. Remember when he was going to take off two, not, two zeros from an IRA? Yeah. Yes, yes, Exactly, yes, yes, yes. okay. Um, you know, which actually would have been a coup back then. Mm. Um, you know, so if we did it today, it would be like saying three naira, uh, three naira, mm -hmm. you know, to a dollar, you know, something like that. Um, but look, it depends on the, ad the advisors. Um, I think, you know, I, I do feel for the governor because he's had to manage so many things. I'll give an example. You know, you, you have the issue of, I have to have my rates high because investors are coming in to buy my paper. So you've now kind of like had to switch to more or less becoming the lender of first resort. So you create all these, you know, MSME fund, 7%, agricultural fund, X percent, you know, uh, maybe a housing fund, X percent, you know. And that is because all these very important parts of the economy cannot thrive, right, with double digit interest rates. 
So the, the, the central bank has had to create these pool of funds, right, and then make them available at a single rate. Under normal circumstances, that should be created, right, and funded by what? The market. The bank. Yeah, exactly. You see? So um, you've, you've, he's, he's had to play those dual roles. And I think for, for the CBN to become more effective and more... Um, Policy-driven uh, yeah, and less... More, yeah, less... In other words, rather than... So, like, I'll use the term loosely, very loosely here, crowding out what, what the bank's role should really be or the, the, the market role should be, and then focusing on really managing the economy itself. Um, you know, those are the sort of things that can help the, the, the governor, maybe in his next term, to actually start shifting towards that direction and allowing, you know, the, the, the market rates to actually become, you know, start that coming down and, and, and allowing the, the economy to, to fund itself, you know? And like I said, I think that, uh, and I reiterate this, I, I, I think the government should really, really reconsider um, its policy stance on using um, its name as guarantees. I think that would be very, very useful in switching, right, from FPIs to FDIs. Mm, mm. Very, very, very useful. And we're heavily... I mean, the truth is that you're already borrowing the money anyway. Sure, yeah. Okay? So the truth is, you know, but here, the point is, if you could stop, if you could significantly reduce what you're borrowing, rather, and then use your name to attract monies into uh, projects, because if a bond is issued, to fund a bridge, the bond is guaranteed by the federal government of mm -hmm. Nigeria. People will buy it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you will get the money. So I want to ask you about the mm -hmm. government's efforts to tackle unemployment. Okay. How do you see that? How, what's your assessment of those efforts, like the Empower program and other? They call it the Empowerment, empowerment and Enterprise program. Enterprise program. Government Empowerment yeah, and Enterprise yeah. program. And what do you think needs to happen at the next level? And even some of the grassroots programs like trade money, market money. Yes, market yes. Money. Yeah, it'll, 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 it'll be interesting to just get a sense of when you look at these, do they trickle? Do they make a difference in the overall economy from a, being so micro? I, my 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 personal opinion, um, I, I don't I don't I don't really think so. I don't think they do. Um, you know, I remember there was one that was done on the. Was your country while back then, which I think was kind of like celebrated. I can't remember what the name was at the time. Had a name it escapes me right now. You've had the ones they did for the oil uh, industry with the whole amnesty and so yes. on and so forth, etc., etc., etc. The truth of the matter is, you know, um, if I if I look at the UK, for instance, um, I remember they had something called a small firms guarantee loan scheme. Okay. What was that? It was basically where and I did a part of a few of those loans when I worked at the bank uh, back then in, the, in that sector, was where the government basically guaranteed loans to small businesses. So I, again, going mm -hmm. back to these things, you know, the truth of that, 10,000 naira. I mean, really? But 10,000, <laughs> you're talking about trading money. I'm just yeah. you know, I'm giving you a good okay. example. You know, so that's why it starts. Yeah. If you repay, you can go high. You can go, I think yeah, it's as can, high yeah. as 100,000. No, no, but the, yeah, even, <laughs> even 100,000. To the individual. No, but I mean, market money they, is they, they, larger because <laughs> it's to the cooperative. We have to be clear. No, but what I'm saying is, is this, is that, you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, there are, there are um, you know, look, the, if you're trying to evolve an economy from a peasant, peasant economy to something that's actually, um, I don't know, uh, really growing and thriving, right? That's, the, the focus will not be on 10,000 or 100,000 naira. So that's the criticism, that it's right? thinking too small? Yeah. So the criticism so the point, is if is we're going to move from 1.9 yeah. to 10% To 10%. To 10%. It's those, I mean, I can, it's like, I mean, let's give you, it's like, oh, let's give them the small so fish. The, so you're saying, so do you think that those programs should mm -hmm. be in the purview of a local government or a local council? Are they, are Maybe. they so it's, micro yeah, they are that micro, they are too be, micro. Okay. You know, in other words, to really have a dent, mm -hmm. all right, okay? Um, and again, I'm using, even in the U.S., they have the same thing, you know, small firm loan mm -hmm. guarantees. Mm -hmm. The point is this, and I keep talking about this thing, the government still just, just can't get it, is that, look, you make revenues, right? Okay. And because you make revenues and you're the sovereignty, investors look at you and say you're the best credit in the market, principally because you have the right to print money. Not that we're in, encouraging you to go print money, right? But, well, 
That's sound argument. Exactly. But <laughs> the point is, that's why you're the best credit. And the point is, I'm not saying is that a government being able to stand behind all these very important areas, right? Small firms, loans, etc. These are the things that is that would encourage, okay, the kind of investments you're looking for to actually get you to growth. So they're asking us to wrap up, but I do want mm -hmm. to ask you, and mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, I'm going to, uh, please guys, forgive me. I yeah. want to ask you, when you say, when we're talking about um, mm -hmm. guarantees, mm -hmm. when you look at a place like Venezuela, and mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. um, and investors are saying, mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I was, I, I heard a conversation the other day, and someone would say, we were one of the last people that got paid from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. So investors are looking at Venezuela. There have been some parallels which scare me about yes. Nigeria and Venezuela. Yes. When you're talking about government-backed guarantees, mm -hmm. how do investors look at these type of things, especially when they look at, when they put the lens of Venezuela on? Okay, so any economy, right, um, where I think Venezuela went wrong was that Venezuela was just, you know, we talk about our economy and we say um, oil is, you mm -hmm. know, our mainstay. Truly really isn't. I mean, the truth is, yes, you know, oil is, um, is we could even argue right now, is it really our mainstay of, of uh, foreign currency? Mm, Probably not. No, not with we remittance. Have, we have remittances now. But the point is, is that it was all talking about, you know, Nigeria also has this massive informal economy. Mm. And that's what really has saved us. So when that oil price right. went down, you know, it's like the woman that is selling a car on the street, for instance, going back to the point of micro business, mm -hmm. right? It's not worried about whether, you know, oil price went to She's still selling our car at our price. She's still making our profits and still surviving. So there's that very massive um, informal economy, which is what we're now saying if we put a lot more investment into. There was something somebody said on, I think it was, is it Tex, uh, TEDx or whatever? Yes. And talked about that apprentice structure they have yes. in our back. Yes, yes, yes. yes Thank I you. saw that. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. Yes. You know, there is so much, but you see, to... to Harness investment into these areas, right, is, is where I'm saying that there has to be that sort of private, uh, public-private sort of partnership to come in. Um, you know, uh, Venezuela is, is really a, a pretty sorry case, um, and the way, you know, things sort of like uh, 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 dipped, and, and that's going to need a total revamp or reset of, of that economy. We've been helped um, by our own uh, informal. informal, yeah, informal. Uh, but you know that that if we could channel that, you know, it's like saying, if you look at agriculture, we have a lot of what um, uh, peasant farmers, right, or let's call it subsistence farming. Now, what we're trying to do is to say, how do you move all of this to get to more commercialized, whereby we can produce enough, not just for ourselves, but to sell, right? And then again, that now comes into that value chain of storage, because one of the reasons why. We, we, you know, we have inflationary pressures, actually, for the food inflation. is because of our inability to store. Mm. And process. And process. Well, thank you so much. It's thank always you. a pleasure to have you on. Thank um, you. Hopefully, we'll see some, of some, we'll see some exciting policy come through. Um, come through. Thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. It's time now for a short break. When we return, Delia Adelike, a political strategist and empirical data analyst, and Larry Olayinka, a journalist and special assistant to former AKC State Governor Ayafai Ashe, will be joining us to discuss the victory of Senator Ademola Adelike at State Governorship Election Tribunal. Stay with us.